Summary of Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts by Les and Leslie Parrott Happily married couples will have healthy expectations of marriage, a realistic concept of love, a positive attitude and outlook toward life, the ability to communicate their feelings and understanding and acceptance of their differences, the ability to make decisions and settle arguments, a common spiritual foundation and goal, a deep and abiding commitment and covenant together. The belief in a happily ever after marriage is one of the most widely held and destructive marriage myths. And they lived happily ever after is one of the most tragic sentences in literature. It's tragic because it's a falsehood. What we anticipate seldom occurs, what we least expect generally happens, especially in marriage. Most incongruous expectations fall into two major categories, unspoken rules and unconscious roles. Bringing both of them out into the open can save years of wear and tear on a young marriage. Too many people miss the silver lining because they're expecting gold. The truth is that not everything gets better. Every successful marriage requires necessary losses, and in choosing to marry, you inevitably go through a mourning process. Marriage means giving up a carefree lifestyle and coming to terms with new limits. It means unexpected inconveniences. Marriage is filled with both enjoyable and tedious trade-offs, But by far the most dramatic loss experienced in a new marriage is the idealized image you have of your partner. It is an illusion that the romance in the beginning of a relationship will last forever. The point is that we marry an image and only later discover the real person. Many people marry to avoid or escape unpleasantness. But no matter how glorious the institution of marriage, it is not a substitute for the difficult work of inner spiritual healing. Marriage does not erase personal pain or eliminate loneliness. Why? Because people get married primarily to further their own well-being, not to take care of their partner's needs. Our faith sees the wedding day not as a place of arrival, but the place where the adventure begins. Marriage challenges us to new heights and calls us to be the best person possible. But neither marriage nor our partner will magically make us whole. The success of a marriage comes not in finding the right person, but in the ability of both partners to adjust to the real person they inevitably realize they married. Couples who swallow the myth that their spouse will make them whole become dependent on their partner in a way that is by all standards unhealthy. Instead, wholeness is found in an interdependent relationship in which two people with self-respect and dignity make a commitment to nurture their own spiritual growth as well as their partners. Robert Sternberg, a Yale University psychologist, has pioneered much of the new research. He developed the triangular model of love, one of the most encompassing views to date. In his model, love, like a triangle, has three sides, passion, intimacy, and commitment. The biological side of the triangle is passion. Passion is sensual and sexual, characterized by physiological arousal and an intense desire for physical affection. But passion can also be possessive, fostering a fascination that borders on obsession. Pure passion is self-seeking until it is linked with intimacy. The emotional side of love's triangle is intimacy. Love without intimacy is only a hormonal illusion. The fulfillment of love hinges on closeness, sharing, communication, honesty and support. As one heart given in exchange for another, marriage provides the deepest and most radical expression of intimacy. 
The cognitive and willful side of the love triangle is commitment. Commitment says, I love you because you are you, not because of what you do or how I feel. Marriage partners do not lock into consummate love once and for all, for love styles in marriage change. Such is the dance of love. Day in and day out, we clumsily shuffle, stumble, and even step on one another's feet in our relationships. But that does not diminish the graceful moments when two partners finally experience the same rhythm of passion, intimacy, and commitment. The human sex drive operates out of the cortex, that thin outer layer of the brain where all learning takes place. Humans use their highly developed brains to learn how, when, where and whether they will give expression to their sexual urges. This ability for control is what separates us from the animals. Sexual desire is not contagious. If you are in the mood, you can't expect that, by default, your spouse will be too. Another important fact to keep in mind is that sex between a husband and wife need not be spontaneous. In fact, the more you talk about your sex life, the more likely it is to be fulfilling. Couples who cohabit before marriage, and especially before an engagement, tend to be less satisfied with their marriages and more likely to divorce than couples who do not. Women tend to see cohabiting as a step toward marriage, while some men see it as a way to stall marriage. One thing men and women do agree on, however, is that their standards for a live-in partner are lower than they are for a spouse. Relationships founded on convenience or ambiguity can interfere with the process of claiming the people we love. The passionate love that begins a marriage cannot sustain a marriage. Newlyweds who equate true love only with passion are doomed to disappointment. If change is not expected and planned for, love is thrown off course. But if the marriage is good and change is anticipated, there is a gradual process of acclimation and love finds a new sense of fulfillment. Each stage has its own challenges and opportunities, and they build on each other, eventually bringing your love life to its full potential. The initial stage of love in marriage is romance. Stage two is the power struggle. Two independent persons forming a way of life together eventually run into power struggles and must learn to adjust to each other's ways. Stage three, cooperation. Now, a sense of acceptance and a willingness to change enters the relationship. Stage 4. Mutuality. It is a stage of feeling at one with each other, where each feels a secure sense of belonging. Stage 5. Co-creativity. The rhythm of intimacy comes to a new and final flourish. Love overflows. Secure in themselves and in their love, couples have an abundant flow of energy for action in the world at large. Lifelong love does not happen by chance, but is an art that must be learned, practiced and honed. Every successful marriage is the result of two people working diligently and skillfully to cultivate their love. When they combine passion, intimacy and commitment, they are able to grow a flourishing, healthy marriage. Here are three of the strategies of happily married couples. Practice meaningful touch. Affection in the form of touching is not only a preliminary to making love, it is a language that speaks more eloquently than words. Plan mutually enjoyable experiences. Passion can only survive and thrive if the couple continues to date even after they marry. Compliment your partner daily. Intimacy is cultivated when we patiently listen, 
not only to the story, but to the feelings our spouses are conveying. Practice unconditional acceptance. The deepest kind of sharing can take place only when there's no fear of rejection. When two people have a spiritual hunger or spiritual awareness in common, they become soulmates. I can't emphasize enough the importance of commitment in sustaining lifelong love. You can strengthen your commitment to your partner by choosing to make it a vital part of your being, by giving it top priority, so much so that to break it is to break who you are. Happiness is a habit. Cultivate it. The trick is to develop the right attitude in spite of the circumstances we find ourselves in. But the bottom line is that happy couples decide to be happy. In spite of the troubles life deals them, they make happiness a habit. The most important characteristic of a marriageable person is the habit of happiness. But happiness does not hinge on better circumstances. A person with bad attitudes will still be a person with bad attitudes, wherever and with whomever he or she lives. Our circumstances change with the weather, but our attitudes stay the same. The negative person defends his attitudes with the rationality of being realistic, while the positive person looks beyond the current state of affairs and sees people and situations in terms of possibilities. But how do we cultivate positive attitudes when our spouses do something we dislike? The answer lies in taking responsibility for our own feelings. No one can make another person unhappy. Everyone is responsible for his or her own attitude. Instead, research reveals that the level of a couple's joy is determined by each partner's ability to adjust to things beyond his or her control. Without the capacity to rise above your circumstances, you will never cultivate happiness. You may have more success, beauty, intelligence, health and wealth than anyone else, but if you do not cultivate contentment in every circumstance, unhappiness is certain. The pain of self-pity that we inflict on ourselves often hurts friends and family too. Every symptomatic problem in marriage, apathy, irritation, boredom, anger, depression, etc. can be traced to a breakdown in personal responsibility. Resentment, even if directed to someone other than a spouse, is always detrimental to marriage. If you expect perfection from people, your whole life is a series of disappointments, grumblings and complaints. Yet, no matter how ideally suited they are, at some point every husband and wife realize that theirs is not such a perfect match. Marriages can never be perfect because people are not perfect. Living happily ever after only works when you make it work. If you find the right attitude in spite of atmospheric conditions, if you program your mind with positive impulses, and if you adjust to things beyond your control, you will discover that living happily ever after need not be a myth. The best time to build communication skills, by the way, is when things are going well in the very earliest stages of marriage. I can't emphasize enough the importance of communication in marriage. In fact, one of the most important skills you can learn is how to talk so your mate will listen and how to listen so your mate will talk. Silence, however powerful, is not the cause of, pure, of poor communication. The fear of pain is... The upshot is that you need to find a way to make it safe for both of you to talk. And this is done by laying down a solid foundation for effective communication. Good communication is built first on who you are 
and only later on what you do. Before practicing communication techniques, these couples work on who they are as people. To enjoy rich communication and a rock-solid marriage, three personal qualities must be present. Warmth, genuineness and empathy. The key to personal warmth is acceptance. Unconditional warmth also invites God's grace into the soul of your marriage. Genuineness is expressed in your tone and non-verbal behavior, your eyes and your posture. You can shower your partner with love, but if you're not real, the love is hollow. Authenticity is something you are, not something you do. It comes from the heart, not the hands. Empathy is perhaps the toughest work of building a strong marriage. Communication is not what you say, but what your partner understands by what you say. When you make you statements, all your partner hears is blame and criticism. I statements are much more effective because they allow your message to be correctly heard and understood. If you can hear, you can listen, right? Wrong. Hearing is passive. Listening is actively interacting with a message by reflecting it back to the sender. Listen for the message underlying the actual words. That's why we lay a foundation with being warm, genuine and empathetic. When reflective listening is grounded in these traits, it is never a robotic function. It comes from the heart. Remember, however, that true empathy in listening involves change. Unfortunately, some people may learn to listen well, but they fail to heed what they hear. Men and women are very different. While our roles can be changed, our psyches cannot. And even though the other sex's behavior is different from ours, it is not wrong. Conversationally speaking, women share feelings and men solve problems. When you realize the two of you are in different modes, labeling a conversation, feeling talk or problem talk works magic, honoring both styles in your marriage and validating your partner's communication gifts. True apologies in marriage can happen only when partners come to understand accountability. People who engage in discussions with their phones nearby, even if neither is actually using it, report lower relationship quality and feel their partner is less empathetic to their concerns. Making marriage work, however, does not depend solely on recognizing our differences. It's a matter of appreciating those differences too. The key, of course, is knowing exactly what those differences are. Men focus on achievement, women focus on relationships. A wife's most basic needs in marriage are to be cherished, to be known and to be respected. She needs to know she is number one in your life. If it came down to an evening with your buddies or a night with your wife, she needs to know you would choose her, not because you have to, but because you want to. Your wife also needs evidence that you are thinking about her during your day. A small gift or a quick phone call to say, you are on my mind, can mean the world to her. When a woman is truly, genuinely cherished, she feels free to encourage her husband's independence. For a woman, being understood means having her feelings validated and accepted. Listening to your wife talk without offering quick solutions is the only way to meet her need to be known. A man who does not feel respected, for example, is apt to become self-righteous and indignant. He feels even more worthy of respect when others don't respect him. He may even give less until he gets what he feels he deserves. Women operate differently. 
When they are not respected, they feel insecure and lose their sense of self. Respecting your wife also means including her in decisions. Some of your husband's most basic needs in marriage are to be admired, to have autonomy, and to enjoy shared activity. Being appreciated is a man's primary need. Men derive their worth more from what they do, while women derive their worth more from who they are. Without being admired, men lose their will to give. You have no idea how damaging a critical statement is to your man's personal power. Admiration is the fuel a man needs to get going. It gives him power. Never fake your admiration. To have any value, praise must genuinely reflect your feelings. Men, when faced with stress, become increasingly focused and withdrawn, while women become increasingly overwhelmed and emotionally involved. Whenever a man is under stress, an important deadline is approaching, he is under pressure at work, etc., he requires a little space. If you learn to meet your husband's need for recreational companionship, you will discover that you are not only husband and wife, but best friends too. But for couples who know how to work it out, conflict can actually lead to a deepening sense of intimacy. Knowing how to fight fair is critical to your survival as a happy couple. Higher incomes can reduce stress, but they don't stop the fighting. Most couples, regardless of income, have conflicting spending and saving styles. 32% of them said money was the most important issue for couples to discuss prior to getting married. Complaining is a healthy marital activity. Airing a complaint, though rarely pleasant, makes the marriage stronger in the long run than suppressing the complaint. As a general rule, criticism entails blaming, making a personal attack or an accusation, while a complaint is a negative comment about something you wish were otherwise. Complaints usually begin with the word I and criticisms with the word you. Partners who refuse to accept conflict as a part of marriage miss opportunities to creatively challenge and be challenged by each other. They also risk more negative consequences. Unresolved, unhandled conflict acts as a cancer that erodes the passion, intimacy and commitment of marriage. The point is that marital conflict is a necessary challenge to be met rather than avoided. We'll say it again. Conflict is natural in intimate relationships. Once this is understood, conflict no longer represents a crisis but an opportunity for growth. Conflict is the price you pay for deepening intimacy. Love may be blind, but for many partners, marriage is a magnifying glass. One of the major tasks of marriage is learning what can and should be changed, habits of nagging, for example, and what should be overlooked, the way a spouse squeezes the toothpaste tube. So before you fight, be sure you know what you are fighting about. God created each person to be different, and to deny that uniqueness leads only to pretense, not partnership. Marriage is not a machine that needs routine maintenance to keep it functioning, but a supernatural event founded upon a mutual exchange of holy pledges. Above all, marriage is a deep, mysterious and unfathomable endeavour. For married couples, spiritual meaning should be a shared pursuit. You have given birth to a marriage that is very much like a living being, born from you both. No single factor does more to cultivate oneness and a meaningful sense of purpose in marriage than a shared commitment to spiritual discovery. It is the ultimate hunger for our souls. 
Marriage, when it is healthy, has a mystical way of revealing God, a way of bringing a smiling peace to our restless hearts. Marriage is closer to the nature of God than any other human experience. Forgiveness lies at the heart of marriage. Dedicating a day of the week to worship stabilizes our marriage and liberates us from the tyranny of productivity that fills our other days. A recent study showed that couples who attend church together, even as little as once a month, increase their chances of staying married for life. Reaching out to others promotes humility, sharing, compassion, and intimacy in a marriage. There are literally hundreds of ways to incorporate shared service into your marriage. The key is to find something that fits your personal style. For soulmates, true service is not self-righteous. It's not done for rewards. It's not a big deal. It comes from whispered promptings, divine urgings deep within the soul of your marriage. Sociologist Andrew Greeley surveyed married people and found that the happiest couples were those who prayed together. As strange as it may sound, there is a strong link in marriage between prayer and sex. No amount of being religious can make up for the time couples spend in shared prayer. The aching, burning urge you and your partner have to be connected, soul to soul, can only be quenched when your spirits are joined by a greater spirit, Jesus Christ. The sacred secret to becoming soulmates is pursuing a mutual communion with God. If you are with someone long enough in varying circumstances, you gradually discover the actual person. One personality type is not any better or worse than any other. The point is that your personality is in your genes. It is inborn. It is God-given. Because empathy is at the heart of every healthy marriage, it's what allows you to walk in each other's shoes without stepping on each other's toes.